following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative, a highly sustainable shareholder-driven cooperative that safely produces, processes, and markets sugar while being environmental stewards to ensure future opportunities for its shareholders, employees, and surrounding communities. Additional support by MAPE members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. And by Ask Me Council 5, a union of 43,000 members who advocate for excellence in public services, dignity in the workplace, and opportunity and prosperity for all working families. Live from St. Paul, we welcome you to another session of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers answering your questions and discussing important issues affecting the citizens of Minnesota. Join the conversation online on Twitter and Facebook. Now here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to Your Legislators. We're delighted that you have joined us on this Thursday evening and we promise an interesting program to you this evening as we discuss the issues of the day. One little matter of housekeeping, I want to express my thanks to Jim Thoreen who filled, on, filled in for me last week when my day job called me to duties elsewhere. But I'm back and I'm hoping to be with you from now until whenever the legislature goes home. Maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that, if not tonight, in some future week. I want to remind our viewers that this is your program, hence the catchy title, Your Legislators, and invite you to call in your questions via the various electronic and telephonic means that will appear on your screen. But I also want to remind you that we appear on Facebook Live, and you can join our discussion using our Twitter handle, at Your Legislators. If you could figure out which one of the ways to use that technology and get your question to the panel, we'll see that the panel hears it. We're looking forward to a conversation tonight about interesting issues of public policy. I should mention that this evening we have uh, the upper body represented here, the Minnesota Senate. The House is in session. It's thought to be unlikely they will join us. If they do, so much the better. But in case they don't, well, you'll get the three of us this evening, and we're looking forward to visiting with you. So let me begin this evening as we do each week by introducing our panel, truncated though it might be this evening, and giving them an opportunity to tell you, the viewer, a little bit about the work that they're doing and the territory that they represent. I begin to my immediate left from District 63 in Minneapolis, Senator Patricia torres Ray. Am I pronouncing that correct? That is correct. Oh, well, we're, uh, it's, we're making progress here. So tell the viewers a little bit about yourself, committees you represent, uh, um, matters of legislative interest, other things that you think they should know as we begin our program this evening. Thank you, Barry. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So my name is Patricia Torres Ray. I represent District 63 in the Minnesota Senate, and that includes uh, South Minneapolis and part of Richfield. I serve in three committees. I serve. Uh, I am the lead Democrat in local government. I also serve in education finance and I serve in Environment and Legacy Committee. This is my fourth term in the Minnesota Senate, and I am just delighted to be here tonight to talk about some of my priorities. And uh, in the past, uh, I have served uh, in education, really, for the entire uh, term in my Senate. Mm -hmm. So education has been a top priority for me, but I'm very uh, excited to be back in Environment. I served in the Environment Committee in my first four years, and I think they were, they were my most productive years. Uh, serving under, under uh, Ellen Anderson, who was the chair at the time. So I'm happy to be back in that committee, uh, committee now, and Senator Ruth is uh, the chair in that committee, and she is fun as a good chair and um, excited to be there. All right, well, very good. We're delighted to have you. We'll have a chance, I think, before the evening's out to talk about both the education and environment. So we'll be able to tap into both of your interests. Joining us for the first time from District 21 in Red Wing, Senator Michael Goggin. Senator Goggin, I think... We discussed a little bit. We've got some mutual friends and acquaintances in the Red Wing area, but uh, introduce yourself to our viewers. Tell, tell us a little bit about your background, your uh, maybe your day job, and you're not in the legislature, <laughs> and uh, 
a little bit about uh, the committees you serve on and your legislative interests. Well, Barry, thank you so much for inviting me here today. I um, really appreciate this. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Uh, day job, I'm an electrical engineer and a project manager at the nuclear power plant outside of Red Wing. Uh, um, in May, that'll be my 13th year down there, and I uh, really enjoy it. It's a great job. I'm married to my wife, Pam, uh, almost 27 years now. Two boys, David and Dylan. Uh, they're doing great. Uh, they're great boys, and I'm really proud of everything they do. Uh, first time in the Senate, uh, and what I'm on, I, I got five committees. I'm on the Agriculture, Rural Development, and Housing Finance and Policy Committees. Uh, policy, I'm the Vice Chair. I'm also on the Energy Committee, the Jobs and Economic De uh, Development Committee, and the Veterans uh, Affairs Committee. And yesterday I had the opportunity in Veterans to present the Helmets to Hard Hats uh, bill, which is a, a bill to uh, help our veterans as they come back from service, uh, get back into the workforce, and we've uh, got a deficiency in our trades uh, people. So uh, I, I came up with that bill with the help of uh, my fellow union members, and. Uh, uh, we got that through the committee yesterday, and it's uh, moving through the process, so I'm really proud of that. We uh, should probably just, uh, just out of curiosity, uh, point of personal privilege, what exactly does a nuclear electrical engineer do? <laughs> well, uh, basically I was a systems engineer down there and uh, when I first started, so I handled the uh, batteries, uh, inverters, 4-inch uh, volt breakers, 4-kV breakers, uh, Whatever we needed help with in the plant as far as anything electrical, uh, I worked on that and uh, supported the plant that way. And now as a project manager, in my, uh, I'll be my ninth year in project management, uh, I get to spread my, uh, my learning opportunities to uh, other areas in the plant, and uh, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. So. Well, very good. Uh, we had an interesting discussion. I've been with this program long enough to say that we had an interesting discussion probably five, six years ago with a state senator who's uh, no longer with us, but about battery technology and the interesting things that are happening there. So, well, we'll save that. We won't, uh, we, won't, we won't go technical on our viewers. Instead, we'll dive right into the issues they're concerned about. We have a viewer from Burnsville who wants us to talk about uh, Senate File 1195 uh, and House File 1504, which is, um, those are bills dealing with the banning uh, uh, or prohibiting local governments from banning or taxing paper or plastic bags. Now that seems to me to be an environmental issue, so we'll look first to you, uh, uh, Senator. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, what you know about that bill and what its prospects are and so forth. So we heard that bill in committee actually this week, uh, early this week, and it was a uh uh, clearly a bill that was not, uh, that did not receive bipartisan support. Um, a lot of local communities, local governments would like to have the authority, obviously, to, to um, direct communities and, and their businesses to uh, the use of the bags that the consumers want. And many cities in the country are already leading that effort. Uh, we know we have in Oregon, for instance, uh, plastic bags are not available in many of the stores. Um, the same thing in, 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 in Washington, you know, in the West Coast, that's a direction that many uh, states are adopting. And it started really with a desire from the uh, local communities to have biodegradable products um, available and really to encourage people to bring their own bags to the stores. I, I personally think that that is a good thing. I, I think that in Europe, for instance, in many cities, uh, in Spain, you definitely cannot uh, use plastic bags and you have to, you're very encouraged to bring your own bag. <laughs> they actually don't have bags available in many places in Europe. So I think this is a, a very important trend that millennials uh, really are pursuing and they value business that, uh, that um, pursue this direction. So I think the imposition of the state uh, moving in the opposite direction is not good for business and is not look good for local government. But that's what this bill uh, proposes to do. Uh, Senator Inga Britson is the author of this bill in the Senate. And uh, I, uh, the bill passed committee uh, this week and, and uh, did, it is not receiving bipartisan support at this point. Senator Goggin, any thoughts on that bill? Uh, well, I haven't had the opportunity to read that bill yet, and uh, so I really can't comment much on it, but uh, as Senator Torres Ray said, you know, 
many of us are getting into where we bring our own bags to the grocery stores and that I personally do and uh, it's just a, a you know a habit that people are starting to get into and uh, I strongly encourage it all right well we'll watch that bill see where it goes from here now we've got a really interesting uh, public policy question bill or question that that relates to a crisis and a problem that uh, communities around the country are having. And so this viewer wants to know what the legislature is doing relative to the opiate crisis and uh, use of uh, various pain uh, controlling drugs. Um, recognize that may not be an area of expertise, but it certainly is something that's been very much in the news. Senator Goggin, we'll start with you. Uh, anything going on in that bill in the legislature? Any comments you'd like to make about it? Uh, we've discussed that. Uh, we have a couple of uh, senators that are do doctors, and so one of them on, on the Republican side, Dr. Jensen, I've approached on that and talked to him a little bit about it. Uh, but as far as anything moving through the legislature right now, I have not seen anything in, in that regard. So. Senator? Yes, I don't serve in the committees that will hear the bill either, but uh, clearly there is bipartisan support on this issue. Uh, it has been, uh, we've I've seen some presentations in committee, not in my committee, but uh, we were given some presentations around um, how per pervasive the problem is around the state. It crosses geographic boundaries. We have problems in urban core, suburban communities, rural communities on this issue. Uh, it, it crosses uh, class boundaries. So we have, you know, upper class, middle class, uh, you know, it crosses ages. You know, we have young people or older people. Uh, using opioids, and I think that uh, clearly um, the communities, uh, legislators, uh, we are aware of the problem right now. There was a map provided by the League of Minnesota Cities that uh, put this issue with transportation as the number one priority for the legislature to address. So clearly we have a number of uh, institutions who are asking us to do it, a number of constituency groups, and uh, I believe that we are going to find uh, measures that really bring bipartisan support to start uh, funding uh, more aggressive measures to combat this problem in Minnesota. You're from Bemidji wants to know whether or not there will be anything happening in this legislative session uh, to allow uh, growing use, et cetera, uh, consumption of marijuana for personal use only. I think we had a discussion with a couple of legislators early in the year, and they didn't think this was going anywhere. But, but Senator Goggin, let me ask you: any uh, any uh, any thoughts on that question? Uh, I haven't had anything come up or had been asked about sponsoring any legislation like that, and I don't think that's going to come up this this uh, this session. But um, you know, it, it's a subject that we have to be a little cautious on. Uh, my concern is with the uh, secondhand smoke with kids. Uh, being in the room around it. Uh, how do we handle it with people being under the influence, uh, operating motor vehicles and other, other equipment? Uh, so there's a lot of things that need to be uh, taken into consideration before we just uh, jump in and, and uh, go for that. So, Senator? I see, you remember we have had bipartisan support for the use of medical marijuana. I think that that has, uh, I, that continues to be. Um, a priority and an issue that we will continue to pursue. I am not necessarily sure that is going to come up uh, during this session because there's just so many things that we need to do. I am not sure that we have enough support to to go beyond that uh, for the use of marijuana. I'm, I'm not sure that we will have mm -hmm. the votes to, to move it forward. So uh, it May is a contentious issue, so I am not necessarily sure that it will be brought up. Uh, it's always dangerous for me to to try to recall what I might have read in the newspaper, but I seem to recall that the governor had indicated that he was not necessarily supportive of this. Am I recalling that correctly? I think you're correct. Yeah. 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 I don't believe that there is enough support. That's always a good sign that maybe you're not going to see a legislative action on that uh, this year. Well, we'll see what happens. Thanks to the viewer for that question. Let's move to a conversation about education. And let's begin with um, pre-K, K-12, sort of the... Uh, elementary and secondary education. We'll talk about higher ed in a moment, but I'd be interested, let's start with you, um, uh, Senator Torres Ray, about your view on uh, what you'd like to see from our education finance bill for our viewers who are wondering about how this works. This, of course, is the budget year, and so one of the things that the legislature is going to be doing is dealing with education budgets. And 
I'll start with you. Tell us, tell our viewers a little bit about where you see that issue going, what you think should be in there. Well, this is for me an issue that um, truly can bring bipartisan support. I think that fundamentally uh, uh, Republicans and Democrats care very deeply about education and how we invest in education. We're very proud of our position in the nation as a state that invests in education and always have a very good indicators um, uh, nationwide. I think there is a, right now, some pressure from certain groups, certainly Chamber of Commerce and others, uh, to put more dollars into private education. And I think uh, the conversation about really improving uh, funding for education, pursuing new ideas, pursuing you know STEM projects, technology, uh, are, 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 are ideas that, that we have in common mm -hmm. and that we would really like to pursue. The idea of exploring private funding for private education is something that is not going to go anywhere in our caucus. That is for sure. And so I, I fear that if we take that direction and if we try to provide incentives for tax cuts for corporations that will fund private you know, uh, uh, um, uh, scholarships or uh, vouchers for private education, our caucus is not going to move. So my hope is that the, the majority caucus uh, will take this opportunity, especially in the Senate. We have four years to explore, you know, uh, great ideas. Um, in the paper today, we saw really the growing uh, appetite in the Minnesota community for uh, exploring char charter uh, schools and how popular they are right now. I think that that Minnesota has uh, pioneered some very interesting ideas in terms of exploring new ideas for education. Uh, we have that opportunity right now, so that's that's what I uh, where I believe uh, we could uh, have some controversy and some differences of opinion uh, between Republicans and Democrats. The other piece that I think is, is important is um, really to continue to talk about the early childhood investments. As you know, the governor has continued to uh, move that forward, that conversation. He wants to fully fund pre-kindergarten uh, programs. I think there is, some, there, are, there is some room for conversation about exploring new ideas in that, um, but there are some controversial issues uh, in terms of um, really directing more and more you know, private kind of voucher dollars into private education. So that's, to me, the most contentious piece that is moving forward right now. Senator Goggin, uh, K-12 or pre-K-12, pre-K pre to 12 uh, education, what's your view on that and where it might likely be going? Well, uh, I'm a project manager and an engineer, so I like to get all the ideas out on the table, all the options out there, uh, explore all of them. I like to keep those open. I don't like to just get uh, tunneled into one area. Uh, until we actually find out what's going to be the proper, the right solution. And I have a feeling that this is going to end up being a mix of uh, a little bit of private, a little bit of charter in, in the public schools. And, and believe me, the public schools in, in Red Wing, for me and my boys, uh, phenomenal teachers and that and staff, they're, they're incredible. Can't say enough good things about the, everybody there. And um, But with that, from my district, my smaller towns, what I hear from our school districts is, you know, the pre-K is great, we'd love to do it, we just don't have the teacher resources, nor do we have the, the room to be able to, to do the kids, you know, have the kids there at the schools and in the facilities. So uh, in the smaller communities, it's gonna be quite the challenge to, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, but we do wanna make sure that we have our kids ready for kindergarten and then have them prepared to get up through third grade because that's basically where we find out, you know, where the kids are, if they're on track or not on track. and. Um, Along with that, though, in Red Wing, for example, we have an organization, Every Hand Joined, and uh, they're doing great things, uh, starting with, uh, you know, finding idea, ways to, to keep the kids going all the way through, all the way to, to uh, through high school, and now into their, their post-secondary school, whether it be a two-year degree, four-year degree, go to the trade schools, but we want to help them all the way through. Uh, so that that's one area that... Uh, or one thing that the uh, Red Wing community is doing, we've got some organizations similar to it up here in the Twin Cities area and across the state. And so that's uh, a, a good thing to be keep in mind, that we've got a lot of interested people, a lot of private uh, uh, charities and, and other organizations that are, are really exploring opportunities for uh, growing our kids and having our kids prepared for school. And so that's, uh, uh, I'd like to keep those options open as we, as we look at it, because I 
I think we're going to come up with a mix of that. So. What's the time frame on uh, education finance? When when would uh, when would we likely see uh, the outline of what um, a bill might look like? Well, we've got our our deadlines of March thir uh, March tenth, March seventeenth, and March thirty first. So we'll be working all of our bills through there. So I would have to say we'd have something uh, pretty well by the end of end of the month. So all right, very good. Anything else on that topic? Let's move on to another topic that's of great concern, and, and I think you were indicating, uh, Senator Torres, Ray, that the uh, transportation piece is obviously a concern of uh, uh, a number of groups. Um, but let's start with you, Senator Goggin. Let's talk a little bit about where you see transportation going in this session, and uh, then we'll, um, we'll move on from there. Start transportation. Well, uh, we definitely have to get the road and bridge bonding bill through that what we had last year that now I heard that loud and clear on the campaign trail I keep hearing it from uh, constituents in the district I'm getting letters emails so I go out in the district one of the first things I ask is where are you at with road and bridges uh, our communities especially in our smaller towns our roads and bridges are in desperate need of repair and uh, so we've got to get that through that's got to be the first thing and then from there we've got to work on a comprehensive plan going forward and uh, and that's what that's what uh, the caucus is working on right now is developing that plan uh, for not only uh, metro and not only rural but for the whole state and uh, I think it's gonna it's gonna be a great mix of different modes of transportation to uh, uh, meet the needs of all the communities Senator George Ray uh, well as you know this is an issue that we we've been trying to resolve for a number of years and have not been able to uh, which is very unfortunate um, many of us in, in the Democratic caucus disagree that we need to use the bonding bill to resolve transportation, and we feel very strongly about it. Um, clearly, we have a deficit and we have a crisis in transportation that will cost, you know, several billion dollars to resolve. At the same time, we have a crisis in terms of really maintaining a lot of our public projects. The University of Minnesota by itself uh, requires about $100 million a year <coughs> just to maintain the buildings that we have right now. So to, to think that we could resolve the transportation deficit by taking dollars out of the bonding, uh, um, bonding bill is, is a tremendous mistake. We have, we already have a significant deficit. We are behind with bonding projects, with parks. Uh, lots of our higher ed institutions uh, have been requesting dollars for 15, 20 years, and we've not been able to resolve those projects. So um, I believe that we need to continue to push for a uh, gas tax, and we strongly agree in, with the governor and actually many, many of the small businesses uh, in Minnesota that are pursuing this. The Chamber of Commerce agrees with us that we really need to resolve the transportation crisis today. I think that what it is very unfortunate is that the transportation, the, the business community has not been, has not really intervened here and have a stronger position and a stronger push to resolve this issue by increasing uh, and by creating revenue. We need to create revenue in order to uh, resolve our crisis. So uh, we are going to continue to stay strong on that message because we believe that the majority of Minnesotans are with us and clearly, clearly the metropolitan area and we know we have supporters in rural Minnesota and uh, all over the state. We cannot put transit dollars into resolving infrastructure problems. We need to continue to expand transit in Minnesota because we need to com maintain our competitive edge in, in, this, in the country. You know, we are behind most developed cities in, in the country and we just cannot continue to talk about, you know, a patch work of projects here and there just to resolve critical projects. We, we really need to invest in transportation. So our caucus feels very strongly that that's the direction we need to take. And we believe that the majority of Minnesotans and understand and support the position that we have. Senator Goggin, any further thought on that? Gas tax increase, et cetera? Uh, that's been talked about, and, uh, you know, it, I, I don't know if it's going gonna, it's gonna to come to fruition or not. Uh, there's a lot of different opportunities out there to uh, look at other funding mechanisms for it, and uh, that's what we're investigating right now to see what's out there. Um, 
it's a difficult, a difficult subject, difficult issue. Uh, so it's going to take a lot of work to, to figure this one out. And uh, I'm not one that just wants to automatically take the easy road and say, well, we're just going to raise the gas tax and that's going to uh, le uh, fix our problems. So we did that in 2008. We raised it in Nickel. And I, you know, people today say, well, we didn't see any difference in the roads uh, after, we, after we started ra raising it in the Nickel. And um, so it's got to be a comprehensive uh, uh, funding mechanism that we're going to need to do. And, and uh, it's going to take a lot of work, and it's, it's going to take a lot of hard work, and I'm willing to do that. So, Let's move on to higher ed. We, we talked about uh, K-12. Um, Senator, let's start with you, because I know that uh, you indicated earlier that education is something you're following very closely. This is also a funding year for, for our university systems, uh, University of Minnesota, uh, the uh, uh, community and vocational schools, uh, Minsky, et cetera. Tell our viewers where you see that issue going. Difficult to predict right now. I mm -hmm. believe that uh, the... And where would you like to see it go yeah, to, yeah. both those things? The, what I hear is that there is a variety, diverse uh, projects that have been heard, so it's, it's unclear as to what the, prior, the, priority, uh, uh, the priorities are. Uh, personally, I feel that we uh, definitely need to address uh, the cost of higher education. Uh, clearly, you know, we are becoming, the university is becoming an elite, an elite university. Uh, I applaud the effort of um, the university to maintain its status in terms of research and, and position as an academic institution. But clearly, fewer and fewer of our kids are able to attend uh, the land-grant university. So it is a problem for us. Many of our kids are uh, leaving the state of Minnesota, attending you know other institutions outside of the state because they cannot afford to stay in Minnesota. That is my main concern. I am excited to see the direction of uh, technical colleges and Menskew in terms of really opening the door to a more uh, 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 diverse population in the schools. I see a sincere effort in Menskew to recruit uh, more uh, students of color. You can see that in almost every camp campus in the state of Minnesota where uh, you visit uh, that, that there is certainly more diversity and, and a special effort to hire faculty and to hire students that are more diverse. I think that's the direction that we need to take and we need to make every effort to expand opportunities so that our kids stay in Minnesota. Um, that's where I would like to see more efforts moving into. The other thing that has been very disappointing, very disappointing to me, is to see the lack of effort to recruit uh, regions at the University of Minnesota that are more diverse. It's a, it's a university that continues to recruit and continues to give opportunities to CEOs and people of high profile as if that is kind of what we need to do uh, with, with the region's uh, positions. I don't see a good effort to, to, to recruit people with diverse backgrounds. So I continue to see that. I'm disappointed that we talk a lot about um, bringing more diversity and, and creating opportunities in higher ed for communities of color and diverse communities and indigenous communities and Native American communities, and that does not translate into specific actions that I can see in either, you know, the, the university. But Menskew is making some progress. Senator, higher education, what do you think? Well, uh, I have two four-year degrees, so <laughs> I'm all for higher education. I have my oldest son's... Uh, Pursuing his doctorate in chemical engineering, so uh, you know. And where I'm, is that here in Minnesota? Or actually, else? it's at the Colorado School of Mines in Golden, mm -hmm. Colorado. Another famous uh, institution. Yes, <laughs> uh, he, he's getting back home. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, when you look at the cost of, of education right now, a lot of it, you know, we, we we have to work on that, and we've got to we've got to come up with bipartisan. We all know that that's a, a huge issue, and we've got to get that squared away, and we have to make it do every effort we can to make it affordable for everybody and the diversity of the population here in the state. It's a, and we have wonderful institutions here. Um, and again, I go back to being a project manager, and when I'm out at the plant and I'm putting in a transformer as my project, for example, I'm bringing tradespeople in. Well, they're my age and older. You know, we don't have a lot of younger folks coming in to the trades, and you know, for, for a lot of kids that might be a good option. And uh, so I encourage, that's why I'm encouraged with this Every Hand Joined and the other organizations that are, are helping kids try to kind of figure out what their path in life is going to be. Um, because we've been on the path of four-year education for so long, but, 
you know, so many kids start and they stop, start and stop, and then they're six, seven, eight years before some of them even get their degrees done. Uh, so we need to, again, look at what other options are out there for the kids. You know, can we have, uh, can they go to the community college for a couple of years, get their undergrad, their liberals and all that out of the way, and, and then transfer those into the, to the higher edge, into the University of Minnesota or Mankato State or wherever. Um, but we do have to work on, on the cost of education. That, that is definitely the big issue. Uh, another thing is, I know when I had my last loans, uh, my interest rates on the loans were a lot less than they are now, but that's because the program to, to get those loans was taken into the federal government instead of having that coming out through your local banks and, and all that. So we need to look at that. I mean, because you look at a six, seven, eight percent loan versus when I had them, they're around two and a half percent. You know, so that's a huge cost on, on the loans. And so many kids are coming out and they've got to take a 30 year payoff period to pay off their, their school loans. And uh, that's just got to, that's just got to stop. We have to come up with innovative ways to uh, make it affordable and, and give the, the, the students the options out there to uh, to make it as affordable for them as possible. You, you know, I normally stay away from uh, contributing to the substantive conversation, but I'll just pass along this fact. I serve as the liaison from the court to the State Board of Law Examiners, which puts me in touch with area law schools. And when you talk about post-college graduate school debt, um, you've, you're talking five figures, six figures in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's basically um, well for some of us of a certain age it's a house of a prior generation yes. so it's a um, I, I don't have a solution to the problem I'm simply agreeing with you that it's a problem <laughs> it so is I, a problem I wish it you, is a problem. I wish you it's well a problem. resolving that you've got till the end of May uh, let us know how it all works out <laughs> well I, I look I say forward to working with Senator Torres yes. on uh, Torres Ray on this because. Uh, it is a bipartisan issue, and we, we do need to get it. I, I say that somewhat in jest. We, we didn't get here in a week or two, and we're not going to get to the promised land, so to speak, in a week or two either. So, uh, But it is a difficult, challenging question. Yes, it yes. is. So uh, we have a viewer from Facebook Live who wants to talk about uh, uh, legislative procedure, essentially. As, as an old parliamentarian, I love this sort of thing. We'll probably drive away all our viewers. But we're going to ask the question anyway. The viewer from Facebook Live, and I'm going to pick on you, Senator, because you're our veteran here. This viewer wants to know, does Governor Dayton have line item veto power on the omnibus spending bill? Uh, and there are a couple of different concepts there that we probably need to explain to our viewers. Um, you've got the uh, line item veto, which, which Minnesota governors have. You're, the president does not. Uh, your state constitution sets out whether or not there is such a thing, and a line item veto means that they can take out a line uh, in the budget, uh, and then, of course, the omnibus spending bill. So let's start by telling our viewers, Senator, what an omnibus spending bill is. Can you tell our viewers about this? Yes, absolutely. So uh, this year is a good year to, for you, for the viewers, to watch what happens and how do we put it together, right? And so in every committee, and we call them divisions, actually, um, we hear the different proposals that will ask for uh, budgets for different pieces. So in education, we will hear almost every bill that um, that is requesting uh, an, an, a budget item, whether that is to increase uh, formula for st all students or is a categorical funding, meaning there is a special category like uh, uh, funding for ELL. All of these proposals, all of these requests that are coming from different members are put into a, a place, a waiting place, to see if at the end we can put them together. And uh, pretty soon we are going to hear our targets. And mm -hmm. what that means is that they will tell each committee what kind of money they are going to have for their committee, for their division. And depending on that target, then they get to select the different bills that will come together for you to, for, uh, to, to use that target that was given to that committee. And that's where the real conversation begins. <laughs> because uh, early, like right now, we have heard so many bills that are probably not going to make it because our target is not going to be as big as the bills that we have already heard. And we keep hearing bills. Uh, so at the end, the committee will have this conversation about selecting priorities. And the House and the Senate will have different priorities. 
And then another, a larger conversation takes place where the Senate presents their priorities, the House presents their priorities, and they're going to have to come together to present one, one budget bill. And that is how the decision is made, basically. Um, so it's based on a target that is given to each committee. And then we present that together. We, we actually, we make those decisions in the, sen in the Senate, the House. They are different. They will come to a conference committee. And then it comes to the governor as a bill, is, mm -hmm. the, is the budget presented by each division. And the governor may disagree with that. And then it's where he can select a line and say that he is not, he's going to veto that portion of the bill. So we have not, we are too, it's too early to get mm -hmm. to that conversation because right now we are hearing a lot of the proposals that are coming from the different, uh, from the different members. So and of course, as the process unfolds, uh, what will happen is the governor's input will be sought as to whether or not he might line item veto a particular item. Uh, or if there could be changes made to it that would cause him to withhold his line item veto. So, so while we watch the legislature in action, the House and Senate, the governor is also in play on, on these things and is, I presume, in regular communication with the legislature through its leadership in both parties, explaining what his priorities are, since he's certainly a player in all of this as well. Absolutely, absolutely. These conversations really go back and forth, you know, between between the caucuses now, mm -hmm. because right now is, is really between the majority mm -hmm. and the minority mm -hmm. in both houses, then the houses come together, and in all of the conversations, really, uh, the executive branch is uh, participating, and really mm -hmm. the commissioner is helping us, you know, create all of the fiscal notes to make sure that we have the information and we have the opinion of the governor throughout this process. So we, we don't arrive to the final uh, decision without mm -hmm. input, you know, without knowing what is the position of each caucus, what is the position of the author, what is the position of the opposition to the author and the governor. So there is a lot of conversation that takes place uh, in the process of crafting a budget in a division, for sure. I, Senator, any thoughts on the budget process? And uh, yeah, well, uh, Senator torres uh alluded to it with the conversations that we're having, and uh, uh, I'm really encouraged by the conversations that uh, Senator Majority Leader uh, Gazelka is having with the governor. I think they have a real good rapport and relationship building right now, and uh, so it's really refreshing to to see that. And uh, uh, I'm very encouraged by that. And uh, I, I think it's a, if we can keep that going, I, I, it's going to be a very productive session. Uh, but I, before I, I go any further, though, I do want to uh, let the governor know he's in my thoughts and prayers uh, from his surgery today. And uh, I haven't heard how it went, but I, you know, I, I'm praying for him. So. He's He's in good hands at the Mayo Clinic. Yes, so. he is. Yes, so viewers from uh, Nicollet County and Nobles County, I warned Senator Torres Ray this might come up. It did. Uh, but they're very concerned about uh, issues of uh, bailing and mowing in the right-of-way. And uh, I suspect this is not a hot topic in South <laughs> Minneapolis, but it might be an issue in, in the area of Red Wing. So I'm going to look to you, Senator. Uh, a viewer in Nicollet County thinks we should leave the ditches alone since they're good for pollination and wildlife. A viewer in Nobles County just wants an update on whether there will be new rules for mowing ditches. Uh, we had a discussion about this two, three weeks ago. I don't know if there have been any changes. <laughs> Senator, can you enlighten us? Well, uh, it's a big issue in the rural communities. And, uh, you know, the thing is, too, is we want to make sure that we're, we're respective of the environment. We've got the pheasants out there, the other animals out there, the pollinators. And so there are certain times of the year that they can actually go out and do the ditch mowing and that. And uh, so we need to be cognizant of that. I know a big issue was uh, pulling permits on it and, and everything else uh, for the farmers and that. And that just adds more, uh, more, more gridlock to them to get that done because it takes a while to get the permits uh, run through the system and, and, and to the farmers and that. Um, but we do need to work, you know, we, we do need to be cognizant. Do, do you know what the status of any of these, uh, we, we had some discussion about these bills, but I don't know that we ever, ever got down to the nuts and bolts of what the status was or what the, what likely might happen in this session. Do you? I think a ditch mowing bill is going to make it through. I just don't know the status of it yet. Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, yeah. It's not just finance bills where there's a lot of give and take. No. There's going to be on that one too, <laughs> I suspect. There is going to be a lot on that. 
We did have Representative Torkelson with us here um, a couple of weeks ago to talk a little bit about the, and in the as part of his visit because he was such a key player to discuss the uh, the setback uh, water, 50 foot the setbacks, lot. the buffer bill, and uh, and that's another area where I suspect we're going to have more action between the session. That, that one's re uh, getting a lot of attention. Viewer yeah. so. from Motown wants to know whether there's going to be any discussion about legalizing more types of fireworks. Anybody hear anything about that, Senator? Any thoughts? <laughs> you know, there's so much uh, that we need to do this session and some very controversial pieces, you know, that uh, that are moving forward. And, and, you know, I serve in local government, so a lot of these things are going to come up. But right now we're focusing on the big piece issues. Right. Uh, that has not come up yet. Um, it's, it's hard to say. I, my sense is that we're going to run out of time. There, there is, a, you know, a, a lot of issues around... Um, um, Local government, uh, that's, that's, uh, that to me are quite concerning. And um, so I think that's going to take a lot of, a lot of time. It's taking already a lot of time. You know, uh, hearings that are supposed to go for just 15 minutes are taking, you know, two hours mm -hmm. to re reconvene last night on, on, on an issue that, uh, that is about local government. Um, so it's, mm -hmm. I don't believe that we probably will get to those issues. That's my belief. Who knows? Any, any thought about uh, fireworks, uh, Senator? It, uh, is it, have you heard from anybody about this? I have not. That's the first I've heard of it. But right. I do love a good fireworks show, and uh, every year our Treasure Island Casino has a great 4th of July show. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll wait and see yeah, what happens there. Yeah. Sure. So uh, I hesitate to ask it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Sunday liquor, can you update our viewers on where that's at? Should we start with you, Senator Goggin? Well, Sunday liquor sales has passed the Senate, passed the House. It's on to the governor for his signature. So the governor indicated he's going to sign it. I guess I should look to you, Senator, maybe. I, I believe so. He, he has I indicated so. that he was going to sign yeah, it. So. Yeah, I yeah. think that's kind of a... It's a done deal. That's All right, so, uh, so as the senator said, now we can move on to other more uh, other important issues. Yeah. So, so we, uh, I want to follow up. Uh, we have a viewer who wants to follow up with, uh, starting with you, Senator, uh, be, because uh, I think you specifically raised this issue. Um, I think this viewer uh, generally agrees with you about um, uh, uh, funding private education with public dollars at the K-12 level. This viewer wants to know about the use of tax-funded vouchers uh, to attend private education entities. Um, I don't think that, I don't think that specific form uh, has been proposed, but maybe you can tell our viewers a little bit about what's going on in that area, just sort of lay out the issue, and then I think you've already explained that, that you're opposed to it, but I think this viewer could wants a little more information about what, what's actually happening in that area. Okay, so, so bills have been introduced, uh, and I, I'm not necessarily sure if they were heard. I believe that they have been heard in the House, not in the Senate. So the proposals are very specifically to uh, open the, uh, uh, to offer tax credits for individuals who want to send their children to private schools mm -hmm. and to offer tax credits to uh, corporations and foundations who will create a program for scholarships for private schools. So those are the two that are, um, that have been introduced. I don't know where the viewer is at with this, but clearly we know that for every private school that offers this opportunity for kids, we will never be able to afford to pay full tuition. So what this is, is a tax break. So if you are a family that want to send the child to private school, you actually have to pay the tuition, and then you will receive a tax break, you know, when you pay your taxes. What that means is that only an affluent person who can actually afford to pay private school can send a child to school. I personally cannot afford to send my child to a private school. I make $31,000 in the Minnesota Senate. So uh, Blake charged charges about $30,000 a year for a private school. So that will take my entire salary to pay for the tuition of my kid to go to high school in Blake. So to say that we are going to use tax dollars to use public dollars to support low-income kids who need to attend private school or parochial schools to support their academic achievement actually doesn't work, actually can't, is not a proposal that 
in all honesty, we should believe because it doesn't work mathematically. So who are the individuals who will take advantage of an opportunity like this are individuals who can afford to pay tuition to a private school and later, you know, get a tax break when they file their taxes. Mm -hmm. The other group that will benefit are larger corporations and uh, foundations that support and promote private education. I am not against private education. I have many friends. I absolutely admire the beautiful schools that exist. I'm a neighbor of Minnehaha Academy South. I think they do a magnificent job. We have magnificent, wonderful private schools in the state of Minnesota, and I want them to thrive and flourish. I just do not believe that in Minnesota we can afford to take funding out of public education to fund private schools. I believe very strongly that we cannot do that in Minnesota. Any other thoughts on that, Senator? Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure I haven't read the legislation on it, so I, I can't uh, speak to and, any And I of think bills. you were saying, Senator, that, that the, the, the bills in question that we're discussing here are in the House but not yet in the Senate. Am I right? I think they have been introduced in both. I do not know if they will be heard in the Senate. Okay. They have not they have not been heard in the Senate. Okay, That's very my good. understanding. Senator uh, but in regards to the to the, those that can't afford private school, I would have to think that there's going to be some kind of uh, opportunity for, for those kids to be able to, to get into those private schools through any uh, uh, scholarships or anything like that. Uh, I, at least I would assume that we'd be able to get something like that through. Again, we've got to have a, a good comprehensive uh, uh, school funding uh, agenda going forward because it's going to take everything to make sure our kids are getting the proper education, whether it's you know public school, private school, charter schools, or homeschooling. Uh, I have a number, number of friends that they homeschool their kids, and uh, uh, so I mean we have a lot of options out there for the parents to, to choose from, and, and for those that uh, uh, need to, need to be able to have options, we need to keep we need to have that available for them. So well, I wanted to give our viewer an opportunity to get a little better explanation for that. So Senator, thank you for that, and uh, Senator, I appreciate your comments on this. Now we've got viewers who are concerned about and are on both sides of the question about. Uh, whether or not we should be taxing Social Security and whether or not there should be any changes in that. So I'm going to pick on you, uh, Senator Goggin, first. If you could talk a little bit about uh, what's happening on that issue. As I said, we have viewers on both sides of that question. Well, when I was on the campaign trail, the first thing I heard was, what are you going to do about health care? We can't afford it. Second thing I heard is, what are you going to do to help us folks out there on Social Security? And they said, we need a break on our Social Security. So I'm all for uh, getting rid of the state income tax on Social Security. And is, is there, are there proposals to do that? Yes, yes, there's proposals. Part of the larger tax bill, I assume? Part of the larger tax bill, correct. Senator, your thoughts on the Social Security tax issue? Yes, I, I do think that this is an issue that we've been talking about for quite a while, uh, too. And I am, uh, I am not sure that we will have, you know, a, a proposal that will find bipartisan support this time, but I definitely believe that that uh, we will be hearing something from the majority in terms of, of a proposal. I, I, I do not know. Okay. Viewers uh, in Aitken and other communities are concerned about um, PCA, personal care attendant issues. They're concerned about compensation, concerned about uh, uh, who can serve as a PCA. At least one viewer wonders whether or not might be possible to provide for spouses as caregivers uh, rather than a stranger or non-family member. Um, and I know that, of course, there have been funding issues surrounding PCA services. So let's start with you, Senator. Uh, that's a pretty general question, but maybe you can bring our viewers along as to what might be happening on the area of personal care attendance. Yes, I, I think we have a significant problem with PCAs um, in, in many directions. And, and the the... So the compensation that we uh, provide right now for PCAs is, is certainly not sufficient. Uh, we uh, know of, you know, from testimonies um, that we've heard over the years that people are not able to recruit people, they are not able to retain people, um, personal uh, care assistance, because their salaries are si simply not sufficient. The proposal to get uh, relatives compensated, in my opinion, is a good one because clearly it offers 
um, you know, it's unfortunate, but they are underpaid, but a relative is willing to be underpaid to provide that service to a relative. So we see that, especially right now with uh, boomer generation, you know, that it really has problems with uh, taking mm -hmm. care of older parents. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they are willing to make a space in their, in their home and pay for that, um, take care of their elderly parents. But certainly compensation is something that we need to, to have for these families. So I think that compensating uh, relatives and compensating uh, caregivers who are relatives is a good option, is a cheaper option for the state of Minnesota. Uh, and so um, I support it fully. To continue to, now, not all families have that option. Clearly not all individuals have that option. They don't have relatives that are willing to do that. And so uh, expanding funding uh, for PCAs is an absolute necessity in the state of Minnesota. Uh, with the market being what it is and the options that exist for jobs, young people don't want, to, don't want these jobs. And so this is a job that more and more is being done by relatives, is being done by immigrants, is being done by older individuals who are retiring and are choosing to become PCAs. And so the, the universe of the population that now serves in this capacity is getting a smaller and smaller and we need to offer the proper compensation for them to be able to do it. So it's an issue we have to work on. Senator, your thoughts on this topic? Uh, well, with the family members, I'd like to make sure they've, they've had some kind of training too uh, because it's, it's a, something that they need to be able to, to have exposure to so they can handle the needs of their, of their uh, family member. Uh, but as far as personal care attendance is concerned, it's, you know, it's almost like a calling. I mean, people really just uh, want to do it because they have some, a sort of calling to it. Uh, so th there's an organization down in Goodview in, in Winona. It's called Home and Community Options. And uh, uh, they were just up at the Capitol the other day, and I had the opportunity to see them again and, and, and uh, talk with them. And uh, they do wonderful work for our, for our uh, folks that, that need the, that care. And, and, um, you know, so we need to do everything we can to keep it so that those folks that want to want to be in that industry can, can afford to stay in the industry because right now they're working two, three jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and, and the work they're doing is not easy work. It's yeah. not easy to do. And uh, so we need to, uh, th this is an area that we really need to, uh, I think, support. And because uh, uh, those folks do a wonderful job with the, with, with the patients and that. And uh, to see the smiles on the, on the faces of the patients and you, know, you hear from them because they don't like to see the change in, in having staff there all the time. You know, they get accustomed and, and, and build a relationship. They're like family members. So, you know, we need to, we need to keep that going because that's such a, a critical part for these people's lives and it's all about quality of life. So, Absolutely. I think we're uh, about at the end. Thank you for your participation. We appreciate uh, we uh, appreciate your participation tonight. We've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, we start into this session of the uh, program where we're dealing with how much or what, where, where do you think we finish? And so do we finish on the constitutional deadline or not? Senator, what do you think? Special session or not? We don't need a special session. I think we definitely can finish on time. Senator Goggin? Oh, definitely on time. I'm so encouraged by what happened at the start of session with getting the health care uh, bill through and getting the, uh, the, the money through to, get, to help people through 2017, getting the tax conformity, the, the rapport and the re relationship that we're having with uh, our fellow members in, in, across the aisle and uh, the members, uh, uh, the rapport and relationship that our leadership is having. Uh, it's, it's, I'm really encouraged. I, I don't see a special session this year at all. One last question uh, from a viewer, and that is constitutional amendments. Are there been any constitutional amendments issued, entered this year that we're likely to see action on? Normally that would be next year, but, but we do see them introduced this year. Senator? No, that we know, that I know of. No, I, have not, I have not been, become aware of any, no. And lastly, real ID. <laughs> About 30 and seconds. You, <laughs> and you left me 30 seconds yes. for the most important thing. I am very proud of the governor, and I'm very hopeful that the Senate will see a path to have uh, a real ID for people who want to travel and enter um, 
federal buildings and also to have an ID that is not compliant with real ID federal requirement but will allow people to drive safely in the streets. That is what I believe the Senate can move forward. It we will have absolute bipartisan support to do both and to make absolutely everybody happy in the state of Minnesota. Real ID, Senator. Real ID, uh, we've got a great bill in the Senate. Uh, Senator Pratt's uh, leading the efforts on that. And I think we've, we've got everything that uh, Senator Torres Ray has, has talked about. Timing, when, when do you think it gets to the governor, those kinds of things? Well, I, I would have to think we're going to hear it next week in, in uh, session, I would bet. And then uh, from there. Uh, now, there, there are differences between the House and Senate bill, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Senator Ellicott, do you? Yes. There, and so there need to be a conference committee. Correct. Correct. And, and actually, the Senate bill does not do what I want. I wish. I've been working with Senator Pratt on it and mm -hmm. with Senator Gaselka. I, I am not going to lose hope. We are close in the Minnesota Senate. There is a small provision in the Senate bill that actually directs the, uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety to not issue driver's licenses through rule. And that is a small provision that I want to take out of the Minnesota, uh, of the Senate bill. I'm working with Senator Pratt. I know that he, he, there is some strong feelings about you know, allowing everyone in Minnesota to, to, drive, to drive and to open the door for the executive branch to go back to where we were in 2003. I don't know if you remember, but it was uh, uh, Governor Tim Pawlenty who actually changed that. But in the state of Minnesota, we used to have uh, driver's licenses for everyone, and it, it was Tim Pawlenty who issued executive order. We would like to go back to where we were in 2003. We are out of time. Thanks to our two guests for joining us this evening. Thank you for joining us this evening. Our viewers, we invite you to be back with us each week until the legislature goes home. Thank you and good night. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org slash your legislators. Find out more about the history of the program, who has been a guest, and watch past episodes and discussions by topic. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. To continue the conversation, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you for watching Your Legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative, a highly sustainable shareholder-driven cooperative that safely produces, processes, and markets sugar while being environmental stewards to ensure future opportunities for its shareholders, employees, and surrounding communities. Additional support by MAPE members. Making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. And by Ask Me Council 5, a union of 43,000 members who advocate for excellence in public services, dignity in the workplace, and opportunity and prosperity for all working families. <laughs>